All right, Zig coming in on the top 10 of the show. We have Timo Karokowski of Armored Dawn. If you don't know, Armored Dawn is a Brazilian progressive metal band, and Timo is their guitarist. And this was a really fun chat we had. We really dive into, like, the kind of guitarist headspace, the struggles of the original musician coming from Finland and trying to make their way in Brazil, and uh, just the kind of normal struggles you have as a metal band, being the outlier in a way, musically, that is. Timo doesn't show it, though. He's an upbeat, positive dude. Um, this conversation was our second attempt at an interview. The first time we used Zoom, and Zoom does what Zoom does and makes everything complicated, and it fell through. So I'm gracious that they were willing to talk with me again, and this is that conversation. But before we get to that, let's listen to a track. This is SOS by Armored Dawn. <laughs> SOS, Armored Dawn, available now on all streaming platforms. Uh, cool stuff. I definitely recommend you guys check it out and check out the live videos and the music videos as well. They're pretty sweet. Um, but yeah, so with that being uh, that being played, we're going to jump into the conversation with Timo. If you guys can like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast on one of the podcast platforms. It helps me keep talking to cool guests and sharing their insights with you. And uh, without further ado, here's my conversation with Timo. Yeah. Oh, I, I can see you have a cat also. Oh, yeah. And there's a – the cat room is actually the kind of quiet room here, so they'll be running around. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have three of them around somewhere here, so. Yeah? <laughs> That's awesome. That's definitely the – it's the musician's best pet because you can go away for oh, a yeah. while. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, that's, why no, that's why you can't have a dog. You know, oh. it's difficult. Cat is much easier. It's too yeah because you gotta you gotta let them out every so like every couple hours and you have to be yeah. there you can't be like out till like midnight and be like how you doing bud oh cool not so <laughs> 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 awesome man well um, to kind of jump into it like when did guitar become like your mode of expression like when did you really know that this is this is my access to self expression. I, I think it started actually really early. I, I, when I was five, I started listening to all kinds of. My, my dad was used to listen to some kind of all, all kinds of old tapes for Led Zeppelin and Cream, and I started listening to those. So when I was five, I loved those. And when I was about, I think I was six or seven, I started playing violin. Oh yeah. And I, I when I was a kid, I played. I, played, I think I played like seven or eight years of violin. And but at the same time, since since five, I, I was also listening to Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin. I I, I always checked that. Oh well, git, guitar might be something I really want to do. And and another thing, because I, you know, always like to improvise something. And with classical music, you don't improvise. You yeah. do, you play exactly how it's written, or you're out. Yeah. So I yeah, think yeah. I start. I, so so I, I think I think I was about eleven or twelve. I decided, no, no, I, I'm gonna get the guitar and I'm gonna I'm gonna turn into guitar player now. And eventually, I quit violin completely. Sadly, because you know, it would be awesome to still know how to play it. Yeah. Well, it, maybe someday I'll get back to it. I should. Yeah, it's it's a it's one of those. There's so much more physical, like st even like mu it's interesting to think of it like musically too. You're really confined to what's written and what you're supposed to do with that that style, um, but also like yeah, physically you have to like hold the violin in a very specific way. And if you really kind of alter, oh that, yeah. you know what I mean. You're it's already physically like follow the form. So that makes yeah. sense why. Yeah, we always have to be exactly, 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 exactly right for season, yeah. or you're doing something wrong. So, <laughs> and it's not, it sounds it sounds rough too. You know, a squeak on a violin, like oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, like, but even like kind of tinkering with the violin w was the ability to like, kind of like make strings say something, like something that came from that experience. Yeah, definitely, and that that helped a lot when you transfer that to guitar playing because. Um, the moving of the fingers is basically the same, just in a different angle. Yeah. So it got to, to learn to learn to learn to play the guitar was much easier that way. And you know, since you already play music, you every, every, everything is in your head already. So that that made that part a lot easier. And I, I really, really since since kid, I, I you know I, I never wanted to be any athlete, play some sports, nothing. I just wanted to play basically. Yeah. So I used to, I used to sit sit alone at home and just practice, and then I go fishing or something and go back home and practice and. That's so awesome. I, I spent a lot of time alone when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. Well, you you uh you didn't grow up in Brazil, right? No, no. I I'm, I'm from Finland, so I first first thirty years of my life I spent in Finland, and then just 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 later I, I met my wife. 
who's from Brazil, and she was still in, in the college doing studying medicine. So I decided to move here, okay. and well, I'm still here, so <laughs> <laughs> that worked out. So, <laughs> so like uh, still around. D- diving into like the guitar and getting into like Deep Purple and like like the rock based things where you kind of like you get that mode of like part of it is like just improvising in the moment you know like some of the biggest yeah, guitar yeah. icons like are kind of in the moment making it up but they're not you know that they're, they're yes. it's there but the freeness and the being in there is like a big part of that experience um so like yes that, uh, sorry that, that that's that i think in, in today's music that's mo- mostly gone hardly anybody does it anymore people are people tend to play everything exactly like it's recorded yeah. and i for some reason, people like to hear that. I'm, I'm old, old school, so I, I, you know, I'd always prefer to hear somebody improvise something over, you know, the songs. But I agree. I that's agree. that's the way the modern life goes. It, I don't know. Somehow it makes makes it much more interesting. Every every time you play it, something somehow a little bit different. And it well it makes it real. It makes it that moment. It makes it the reason oh, I yeah. went to see you a- perform absolutely. right now is to hear you do that that way. And like, and if yeah, performer, exactly. You know. It's a, yeah. even like the highest like kind of pinnacle of music. Like if you think of like improvising, it's kind of like jazz and stuff. Like, but it's all yeah. this routine structured thing. But when you see it, it's completely John Coltrane, and you're like, what? Oh yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's it's completely like not even relative to what you thought you were gonna hear. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Make uh, makes it more interesting that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like getting some of these like. Uh, getting some of these rock things down, like were were you mostly like kind of like uh, practicing writing your own stuff, or are you mostly kind of like learning other people's like phrases and licks too? Eventually, like when you f- like dove into like the Deep Purple and like the Cream and like uh, to get away from that kind of classical routineness, were you like working on that self-expression in that way? Yeah, yeah. I I I yeah I I did kind of a mix of a both, but I was always always kind of lazy to learn entire songs. So I always learned a part of one song, and oh no, then I move to the next song. I start learning some riffs from the other song, and then some part of solo from a third song. And you know, I was as especially when I was a kid, I was I was you know I I, I didn't have patience to learn the whole song <laughs> by ear. So I ah, now let's go to the next one. <laughs> but but it, it kind of I, I think it kind of helped because. You know, when you don't learn the whole song, you know, you don't start copying anybody exactly because you, you know, get influence from everybody that you, you have more time to learn more songs from more people, you know. Yeah. So you definitely. don't have to copy one person. Definitely. So you, you know, the spectrum is much wider that way. You learn a lo- lo- lot of other stuff. <laughs> and it's like. It, it keeps things more interesting. Yeah. And it's like you you can really focus on like a nugget from like that. Richie Blackmore, like you can take one lick of his and yeah. like, make it your own, and like really understand that thinking and that one part. You know, you can really dive into it. Exactly. And I was the same way too. Yeah, like, and, like, and one, one <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and one, 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 one thing that also was interesting. I, I remember when I was a kid, I was, I had a teacher that was an old old chess player. I think he was yeah. like seventy something already, and he has he said he had been playing almost sixty years, and he was still learning everything every every day and. He, he, he said one thing interesting that I started doing, that when, when you learn the song from the others, you know, don't just learn the guitar part. Start listening to, like, if you listen to any, any pop music, there's some, you know, trumpet, something, some other instrument. Try to learn those parts with the guitar. So that that's really helpful. That really develops your, you know, skills. Don't just play the guitar part. Try to learn the other parts also with the guitar. So That's cool. That's, 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 that's really interesting. And that's, you know, that's really helpful in the understanding the structure of the songs definitely definitely because if you, know, you, you yeah. play in a different way like a horn player is oh yeah breathe and phrase differently than a guitar player would just physically who is a who is a jazz guy exactly with who is that guy oh it was it was not, nobody famous it was just a old, old jazz guitar player from finland and you know it was in a music school where i used to study and yeah okay. he was he was really that's, that really helped to educate people. So, you know, I, I learned a lot of those those days. Wow, like that's but that's those are the guys that like they plant those nuggets and those come through later. So, okay, so diving into like yeah. getting this stuff down and expanding your listening, like was there a song in particular where you really dove into like trying to learn the other parts via his recommendation? Uh, 
No, not nothing specific. I I, I basically learned a lot, lot, lot from chess, chess players, you know, because yeah. there's a lot of interesting interesting parts. More more commercial, so not not uh, all, all kind of fusion stuff because that's yeah. especially for beginners. There's lots of stuff really difficult to understand what the hell they're doing there. Yeah, but, you know, old, old, old school music. <laughs> that's awesome. So, like, when did when did you start writing your own music and like started like diving into you like trying to make a band? That I think started around when I was about fourteen, fifteen. Okay, and was I, started, it... I started writing on songs. More. More, 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 mostly dirty, the deep purple kind of that that area. Okay, okay. You know, I, I think I think it was a 16, 16, 17. So I got my first, first band and band together, and that never really went anywhere. But you know, we we tried hard. Yeah. <laughs> I think the the, the the first band that we really managed to get to get to start playing show, shows. I think I was maybe maybe around twenty one. Okay. You know, then we had everything. We had guitar, bass, drums, and guy guy keyboard player with real Hammond B three and. So, you know, real, real, real things, <laughs> heavy as hell to carry yeah, around, but, you know. <laughs> that guy was breaking his back. <laughs> or all you collectively yeah. were breaking your backs. <laughs> yeah, all, all of us. <laughs> wow. So, like, when you, would, uh, when you would gig, were you playing, like, original gigs, or were you doing, the, like, the cover gigs, where you would go in and do, like, four hours of, like, uh, cover music to the bar? Like, what was, like, the kind of beginning gigs like? It was it's most mostly our own songs because you know, okay. especially at that time in eighties nineties in, in Finland, uh, the, the cover band scene was never that big. You know, okay. if you have a had a cover band, it was like ten people, because people really evaluated the bands who write their own material. So there was bands who write their own music. They at that time they got a lot more lot, lot bigger pop public than you know cover cover bands and That's so awesome. the cover bands were not that big. That time, it's, I think that was awesome. These days, sadly, I think it's kind of changed. So a lot of people like the cover bands. I definitely, but I, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, like, is it the same? Do you think it's the same in Finland now? Like the cover bands are getting more. There, there, there's, I think there's a lot of cover, cover bands, but it's from what I'm still, a lot of bands writing their own material. So I think still, 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 people like to like to you know. They they value a lot of bands who write their own material, so that's why there's lots of bands from Finland coming out these last years. That's awesome. It's interesting, like because like here in America, it's like the, if you don't do like the cut, if you don't do the thing everyone's expecting, it's kind of like what's going on. It takes a yeah. long, long, long time before anyone cares what you wrote. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you got the small that's, little clubs. Exactly. And... <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly the same thing here in Brazil. Yeah, people just want to see cover bands. That's interesting. Like, There's a lot of, you know, it, it's kind of, kind of sad. You see bands that have like three, four albums out. They go to some band to play and they're opening show for some Iron Maiden cover band. Yeah. Is it like, <laughs> is it like a, that's kind of weird, but. Um, it's like the, the, the cover, is it like a lot of like kind of like tradition? Because like with Brazil, man, especially with guitar. Man, there's some amazing yeah. guitar going on in Brazil, man. There's a, like that whole style. Have you ever dove into that? Like, I know it's out of the metal kind I, of I, I, realm, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I tried some. The, the other guitar player, Tiago, the band, he's really good in all this. He plays all kinds of chess, chess things and this everything. I think it's more into bossa nova and stuff. That kind kind of chassis, and that's what it's really complicated to play. And you know, I think you really have to be born born <laughs> since the kid to listen to that to get it really in your head to play it right. But I sometimes try to play something that, but just acoustic guitar, but. You know, I, I I tend to stick more to the rock and roll side of things, but uh, but what, what's good thing about especially Brazil and I think many countries in South America, the drummers and percussionists they are really good. They have kind of different vibe, you know, than like in Europe because you hear like a German drummer, they play like a like a metron, that's like a machine. But here, you know, everything everything when the drummers play, they have a more swing, you know, kind of kind of understand better the rhythm. They are not like just straight like the machines. Got it. Okay. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah, some, some have the yeah they somehow have to read them in their soul, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, like, especially with, like, rhythms of, like, just in any different culture. It's like, uh, like coming from a place where everything's in four, it's so simple, you know? But yeah. you go somewhere else, and they're like, I can't get into that feel, <laughs> you know? Like, in, like, something like Bossa Nova or anything like that. It's such, like, 
they like especially with like the chord changes that go, go on top of that like they're pretty complicated yeah. and quick but they're always in that to dead to dead you know like uh, it yeah. seems they make it seem so flawless and easy and it's a smooth music you're oh, like, yeah but when you try to <laughs> put it on the click and you're like oh, God. <laughs> Some, somehow somehow I mean, yeah you, i mean you play the right note but it still always sounds wrong right. somehow you don't <laughs> <laughs> But that's also like the beauty of kind of immersing yourself in it. Cause I bet like, I've bet kind of like playing in the scene in like Brazil, you've picked up stuff that you wouldn't have. Would you say? Yeah. Yeah. Like what? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think from here, I think my, my sense of the rhythm is getting slightly different. Cause you know, I, since I spent 30 years in Europe, I, I, I was also like more, more, more sticking to the metro and with the yeah. <laughs> four by four thing. And, now, now I'm more, I think I'm playing more freely, like trying to slowly get into the rhythm, but I, I'm not sure if I ever get onto the level of the, these local guys, because these are, they are really good, you know, what they're doing. That's awesome. It's interesting, you know, also like kind of metal itself is kind of like uh, to the click, to the beat thing. And that's like, yeah, that's what's so like appealing and cool about it. Like it, it fits that structure and just like is, you oh, yeah. know what I mean? Like. So yeah. they kind of do something where follow you're... The, follow the bass. <laughs> yeah. Follow the bass drum. Follow the bass drum. <laughs> <laughs> so they do something that's off it. You know, it's like a whole nother like plane of feel. Um, yeah. So when you when you started in Brazil, I know you met you met your keyboardist first, right? Yeah. So like, how did you guys yes. how did you guys meet? Were you doing like original gigs as well, or were you doing like cover gigs? How did that come about? Yeah, we, we both had a di- were in the different bands. We were playing Oriental, Oriental songs, so we always met in the bars playing okay. together. Because here, usually, usually nobody plays alone in the bars. They join like four or five bands together. Like I think it's one in the USA is the same these days. Because you know, just one band don't draw yeah. enough <laughs> enough crowd to the bar. So you join four or five bands. So here it was all already a long time ago like that. And yeah. So we always get meeting in the, in the bars, my band and his band, and we always figured, oh, no, we have to do something together because. You know, I'm old school, and he was always a big kind of deep purple also, and he like Hammond and all old, old school stuff. And you know, when he joined Armored Dawn, he joined before me. I think like one year before me. And then, then one day they were needing a guitar player. Actually, actually, I think the singer had an idea that they would try, try, try to make the sound sound a little bit more European because he liked liked that kind of music. Then the keyboard player Rafael, he remembered, that, oh yeah, I, I know a guy who's actually from Finland and plays guitar, so let's call him. Okay. And see if he would be interesting. So, it's a bit, what's the better way to try the band to sound like, little like European, than to get the European to play in the band? So <laughs> that's how he called me. <laughs> then I joined them, and for eight years here yeah. we still are. Okay, that's awesome. That's like you know, just to find anyone who wants to do the same type of musical expression that you are really moved by is so hard in anywhere. You oh, know, and like, yeah, especially when it's original and you're like, hey, we're going to go uh, do our own music. It's all going to be uphill. We're going to make no money. We're going to be really tired. It's going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sometimes it's a hard sell for anybody. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, but eventually, you know, it pays off and like, but that's it. So, OK, so like what when those early like first get togethers, like you guys were playing and they wanted to get that that sound. Um, did they have music written already and they showed you parts or did you come in like showing them parts? Yeah, actually when, when I joined, they had the, all, everything, all the songs for the first album was, had been written already. Oh, okay. So we, we decided to, we rewrote some parts. We put, added some different riffs there, but basically, basically it was all the same. We just, when we went to Europe, we actually recorded in Denmark. Oh, wow. In a, in a studio. Let's try to sound it more European. So we went to the... When 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 their studio tried to do everything old school and use real Hammond every everything you know old, old school and the result was really good but the, the sound wise I like it but the, the songs because you know they were older already so that was really not the band actually writing them so it was it it came up more in the second album when we really had more more time to write all the songs together and then it turned a little bit heavier and you know then then we managed to join the band together and. All, 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 all bring their own ideas, and when we join everything together, and since then the second and third and the fourth album, that's all, all been done the same way. 
But it, okay, well, it always it's like it's interesting because like if it's kind of like the brainchild of someone else, right? Like you're that first few like stages musically is always kind of like feeling how all these parts are they going to stay? Are they going to stick? You know, and then like yes. that, that, <laughs> that, going through the discography that like makes sense. Like listening through yeah. um, everything I could find on you guys, um, and like so okay, so when that when that the initial like session went, you did the parts, you played the uh, the RA composed material. When it became time to like put stuff together as a group, was it kind of like building off like seeds that um, were already there? Like, did someone bring? Did would you bring like a riff and like that would grow or would like? Like, kind of typically, what was the Armored Dawn, like, approach to bringing a tune to the group? It was that there's some songs that one some guy did alone, but most most of them we did exactly this way. Somebody guy, somebody brings a piece of melody, some rhythm, so some some drum, you know, some, some drum turns or something, and or guitar riff or anything, and then we join everybody in the studio and start, start checking what we could do. You know, we, we start doing demos in the beginning because we have a we, are, we have our own recording studio kind of. So we managed to record everything we think of. So whenever we have idea, we record it, and then we keep listening to it. We go home and listen. Oh, this, this maybe this we could change, or somebody else has a better idea, and we go back to the studio and change it until everybody's happy with it. Or actually, actually more more like until we figure that oh, we've been <laughs> doing two months this one, so let's finish it off today. Let's <laughs> decide this is gonna be it because. You know, when it's too easy to change something, you're never happy. You always yeah. always find something else that you could do better. So unless you have put yourself some kind of limit, though until this date, this must be ready. So that's never going to finish. I def- so, no. but that, that way, we did all the songs. Okay. All right. So that that's really cool. That's cool that you have this like this outlet where you can go in and be like as meticulous and like as like driven yes. to bring something home as you want. But I think that what you just said, like, oh yeah, to put the the put the nail on the on the on the coffin or whatever the oh yeah down be like that, it's done. It's such a hard thing to do. That, oh yeah, and that that that's important. If you don't do it, yeah. you'll be the one year writing one song. <laughs> Is that you're never gonna finish. <laughs> Is that like so? Is that um? Is that kind of why like because uh, I saw one of the last releases was a remix. Um, is that yeah. also like why why that some of the remixing has happened because of like you guys got better tech or just like a different idea and it panned out cool enough where we have to do that? Like, <laughs> oh, it, it it was actually because we had, we, we had extra time and we started experimenting with some uh, some lower tuning, so we tuned it down a little bit. Oh yeah, and we figured oh this sounds a little bit heavy. A little bit heavier, and but no, now it's now the other parts maybe doesn't sound that good. So let's let do it again and down down to it slightly, maybe one 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 step or half step, and then do it again and try to make it oh, okay. a little bit heavier. Yeah. Plus, plus, besides, because I, I, I think the songs that we are now we did, I think we did two songs now. Those are those were written like three four years ago. So we've been playing that for three years. So everybody learned better at the song. So uh, yeah. now, now it just sounds better when you play it. Yeah. So w- what do you drop tune it to? Like, so if you're going half step down, where are you going half step down from? Is it just like? Oh, we, we actually. Yeah, we start we start from E flat, but then we went one step down, and now now, now there's some songs that we, some songs that were experiment. We went two steps down, and you know that that we parcel with. Partial, we did that like every band now does, does because the singer starts getting a little bit older and he has start having problem to reach the higher notes. So to make his life easier, we start you know tuning everything down slightly. That's cool. But then, then it's kind of kind of kind of kind of it's you know it is it seems that all the bands they play more in the lower lower tuning. So it's kind of kind of sounds more modern. Got it. Okay. And the people really seem to like that. So. You know, let's let's try to do that that kind of stuff. To, to, to me, like like for us, we play it, so I, I don't care so much in what tuning it, except that you know, in, in the beginning, well, of course, you're in your head, you get used to some tuning, and then you play the exactly same thing one step down. It sounds wrong. <laughs> yeah. You know, it takes yeah. it takes some time. Takes some time to get used to it. <laughs> it uh, even you do it, even you do the exact same thing you've been doing for four years. <laughs> <laughs> it totally does. It's 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 also strange, like as a singer. Like I could totally like 
Oh, like that sounds awesome. Like let's bring that A down to yeah. G. Let's bring that G down to F sharp. Come on. I got that all oh, day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like uh, <laughs> you know, and like it's it's cool that the the kind of metal genre like that lends itself to that. You know, like because yeah. it sounds heavier, it sounds right, and the lower you go. But as yeah. a guitar player, like when you start to drop it down, like I just started playing a a baritone guitar. We got one from a yeah. actually a trash. Some dude trashed it, like gave it a chuck, and uh, me and my dad repaired it. Right, and like uh, it's it's weird to be like playing an A in the mind, but a uh, oh yeah an e, an e on the guitar. You know, like it's just <laughs> conceptually like I'm still playing A, but I'm not. You know, it's so weird that yes. almost <laughs> some of that kind of like perception of pitch is like. A mental thing like <laughs> like oh yeah absolutely <laughs> especially when you play it you know? but like so tuning down have you found like any like like uh techniques that are easier or more difficult via doing that uh to me actually i think technically nothing changed so dramatically it's just just to just get used it in your head but okay. really because the i think that's that's, a, that's a big, biggest problem for me that was by you know technically by playing. I think I didn't I didn't see any any big differences. Okay, cool. Yeah, because like I don't know if sometimes I think like when it's lower, like you can you can get like a deeper kind of jab a little bit. Like you get a little bit. Like, yeah. And also, if you change the string gauge bit, like that dev that definitely makes it a little rougher. The like really kind of oh yeah yeah end up yeah. Or, like kind of like do some like 16th like trills or whatever, <laughs> whatever you know, I mean, like little things like that <laughs> get to be a little more challenging, yeah. but like that's okay. But the, okay. So like the remixing is coming from that. That's cool. Cause then, you, cause as soon as yeah. you play something more as a unit, like it develops its own thing. And like, it seems yeah. like that has been kind of like what you guys have done since the first record. Then like it slowly, the yeah. band became its own thing. Okay. Very cool. Yes, Very exactly. Cool. Um, it's kind of an old, old, old school thing to do because, you know, in the in the old days, it wasn't too, so easy. Like today, today, everybody stayed at home in front of their computer and write things. And then you send, you know, send yeah. the files to the others and people add things and then you join everything together. So a lot of people do that now. But I, I prefer to join the band in the same room. And, you know, whatever you want to comment on something, it's easier when the guy is writing, standing right in front of you than, you know, through Internet. So definitely I, I, I prefer it that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's real, and it's you're making something together. You know, it's not like yeah. it's not play, uh, play to the click, copy paste. You know, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I love the, I love if I don't <laughs> if there's some takes where you start grinding your head up against the wall and you got the idea down. Let's come back to it later for sure. But, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's something so much more organic about that, and something so much more pure about what you're yeah. doing and i think that shows via the records um so like yeah as you guys started to write your own stuff and like was like i don't know much about like the brazilian metal scene or music scene really like is it was it as difficult like you know you have a event in a bar in their own songs maybe that's 50 people you know people don't really go unless they really know the band so most of uh, most of the Brazilian bands are actually, actually there's not so many many Brazilian metal bands that ever made any success. That they, they did that after after they managed to do something abroad first, like like Sepultura. No, nobody here care about them until they start playing in the USA, in Europe, Japan, everywhere. So then people start start paying more attention. But but on, on the other other hand, I think at least at least it used to be like when I was still in Finland, like there's bands like Stratovarius. That was the. I think it was the first like a big, bigger band that managed to get out of Finland. So, I think they had like three albums out already, and they were still playing for 30, 40 people in the bars in Finland. Until today, they sold seventy thousand albums in Japan and hired the ex keyboard player of Yngwie Malmsteen to the band. That's when they went out. Then Finnish people started to go, "Oh yeah, I always <laughs> loved this band." <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> as soon as you get that one, yeah, cool they start getting the crowds going. <laughs> yeah. They had some German drummer and the keyboard player of Yngwie Mamsi. So now, oh yeah, I love, I love this band. <laughs> that really helped them a lot. So that's what got, got the band going. Okay. But that for them took like four albums to do. That's interesting that like, kind of like, um, 
the idea like that you're out doing things in different countries like kind of makes you bigger at home. Yeah. Even like when you're like going out and you're yeah. like playing like the small rooms to nobody. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, it's, it, the, yeah. pers- the perception that you're like, you're going out on adventuring is almost more appealing yeah. than like, but it's weird that it's more appealing yeah, yeah. home base. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. it's interesting. Well, well, some- sorry. <laughs> It, for, for some reason, it, it kind of ma- makes you look like bigger band than you actually are. Yeah. I, I think it was somebody from, somebody from Kiss used to say, I think in the beginning, that nobody knew them, but they had a, a huge wall of amplifiers. They tried to, tried to make themselves look bigger than they actually were. And that's helped them to rise up. Because people start paying more than, oh, this band must be huge. They have a huge wall of Marsa. So what the hell is this? <laughs> I never heard of them, but this, they must be famous. No, I think they kind of work the same way when bands go abroad playing. Oh, they they are touring in the USA. Oh, that must be huge. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, there, there's the entertainment in the like the kind of character aspect of it, I guess, which I think yeah. I think the Kiss uh, point you brought up really illustrates that. Not all those amps yeah. were like had speakers in them, <laughs> like you know what I mean, like. <laughs> <laughs> there's only one mic on that amp, but there's a wall of them. <laughs> yeah, it's, nowadays it's even worse. You have a huge wall of Marsas and there's no microphones. Now, <laughs> then they have a camper behind the wall of amps, <laughs> where everything goes straight from camper to the PA. So, um, and like it's interesting too. Like in Finland, like it's like. Th- not that they have to go anywhere, but as soon as people go to them, you know, it's almost the opposite in a way. Like, oh, the Ying Wang guy, he, he came in, like, their keyboard player came in now, like, oh, you're hanging with cool people. <laughs> like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's that's true. It makes you, makes you, makes you more cool when you hang up with cool people. Right. Apparently. But definitely. It's, it, as a band, like, you guys see all this and it's like, what do we do? You know, like, and do you like as far as like a band like have you guys ever like brought that up like how like to find ways to, like do that type of thing like have you ever brought other people in or thought about or had conversations like this with the crew to try to like like dive into that type of approach? Yeah, we, we were thinking to think about actually in the before the pandemic started, we had set some plans to you know to get some other like like like, a, like get some more famous singer tour with us, you know, we could be the backing band and join them and then he could sing some more our songs together with us and, you know, yeah, make some shows, America and make some songs in USA, Europe and, you know, just get one guy to, you know, join, join us, you know, temp- you know I, mean, I mean, play his songs like five, six, seven songs was his song and he plays, would play like two, three, four songs of ours and rest would be normal. So that, that would, you know, really draw attention to the people. Yeah. But then, so like pandemic went to hell <laughs> so, but we're still to do it someday <laughs> yeah that definitely that definitely stopped any leaving anywhere <laughs> <at all>. yeah. <laughs> yeah we had like we had like, 2020 we had like 70 shows booked and we managed to do the first five and then the world stopped yeah god um like, like I get, five's pretty good to get in <laughs> like <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> i think we the last it was weird. The last gig we played before the shut we played in New York and drove back. And that week, everyone was like, "Hey, the world's shutting down." You're like, "What?" <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, did um, so like with that one thing that was interesting here is uh, a lot of the venues would do stream shows where they would bring bands into the venue and they would kind of like try to collect donations. Yes, yeah. did uh that happen in Brazil? Yeah. They, they they tried to do that in the but but you know it 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 it, um, it wasn't financially you know didn't make any sense for them they didn't manage to make any money nobody made any money with that so they basically yeah. quit and, and and here basically quite fast people know that oh I can pay like five dollars to see this band do the live thing here or I can just go to YouTube and check another show of them for free <laughs> <laughs> why are you gonna pay <laughs> yeah and the YouTube one doesn't <laughs> lag. <laughs> Yeah, they also did. I think one or two shows, some something they did in the stadium, that you know everybody went there with their car. You know, like a like a drive-in oh, movie yeah. they used to have yeah, yeah. long time ago. So you try to do it was the same way. You got your you listen to everything Bluetooth with your headphones in the car, but you know <laughs> that's it's not the same thing. You can't see band there somewhere in you know 
far away playing, so uh, that didn't work out. Uh, plus, that way they didn't get so many people there, so the course were too expensive, so it wasn't worth of doing anymore. Did you guys do anything? Then everything just stopped. Yeah, did you guys do any any of the streams or any of the, the drive-in shows? No, no, we didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> we didn't start start doing that yet. A lot of, like, it was, it's hard, it was hard. Like, I found myself doing a lot of streaming with the venues. Like, me and a buddy had, like, a little production company, and we would just get headaches being like, it doesn't work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so being on both ends of it. <laughs> Um, it's got kind of, kind of desperation. I have to try to do something because you know, yeah, you no, know, nobody knew when things gonna, you know, when when the hell is gonna finish. If, if you knew that it's gonna finish only three months, that's over. So that would be cool, but nobody knew what's gonna happen in you know next week, next month, next year. That was the that was the, I think the biggest problem of everything. Nobody knew when it's gonna finish. Right? Did um uh what so like what when that all kind of came down? What I what I had to do for myself is I just made a schedule. And like I would wake up, I would mm-hmm. do this, I would practice this, I would learn this, I would spend an hour writing, and then like it'd be four o'clock, and then d- do whatever. Like that really kind of like yeah. made my brain like handle that time easy. Oh, yeah. Like to the point where like where I started going back to work and teaching again, it was kind of like I'm wasting all this time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what did what, <laughs> during that? What did you find worked for you? Oh, we did basically the same thing. We were still in the studio. We we were trying to do some, you know, some some uh, what was the name? Chingos for the you know TV TV commercial something you know. Because oh, okay. we the, our our studio our studio was was in a bigger complex that has like I think four or five other studios and there was two guys that with their job they were recording Chingos just for TV and radio. Oh yeah. So they were always needing was needing somebody. To, oh, can you come to play some part of the guitar? We need something in the drums here. So can somebody come to help? So. That helped us a little bit to you know, get some money to survive the pandemic. That's awesome. To I mean, do that kind of stuff. Man. But plus it's educational. You know, it's always good to do something different. Right. You always learn something. Like, and it's interesting, like, because that's basically all hook. <laughs> you know what I mean? When you're working on a jingle, it's yeah. got to be like, it's got to be like, sell the thing, get the people listening to the thing. Like, and it's, it's just a musical exercise. <laughs> I imagine that'd be like, and it stylistically has to be all over the map. Like... Do you do you guys do oh, that yeah. a lot? Do you find yourself in that room a lot, or was that mostly just during the pandemic? Well, mostly the pandemic. So now we are not not doing that anymore. Okay, so we still do that. So yeah, but most mostly mostly most during the pandemic we were more busy doing that. Now now we try to now we try to do other, now now we try to do other things. We stay busy with the band. We are also few of us. The other guitar player, he's a teacher also, so he teaches. I, I have a few students. I'm really a teacher. I'm oh. really that good. You know, I, I, I know how to play, but uh, I, I was never a teacher. So I kind of try to teach. And when the, when the kids, when they get to a certain level, I send them to, you know, school or something. Go there, learn to learn to learn, learn everything right way. And, you know, yeah, I, I can point you to the right direction. But those, those are the guys who are going to really teach you. You know, it's, a, yeah. it's different things to know to and know to how to teach other people to do the things. It's, it's a diff- different kind of talent. I, I agree. Like, and well, just knowing that this is the li- like one. I think that as a student, knowing that this person I started working with thinks I'm ready for a higher level thing, I think that's a huge compliment you can give them. You know, and on your end, like knowing that okay, if they want to, like that's a like that's a really deep thought, like higher level way of handling. Like you're moved on, like because like a lot of a lot yeah. of anything with music is just like. How do I get my fingers moving to make it fun? Okay, cool. Now it's fun. Yeah. And like I'm going rapid. I'm learning all these different bits and trying to make my yeah. own thing. And then like it, it hits like a certain point where you're like, oh, I really need to rethink what I'm doing. I'm not doing as good. You know what I mean? Like everyone kind of hits yeah. that wall where they like they try to do the gig oh, yeah. and like something <laughs> something just goes wrong. And like then you reexamine, <laughs> but you've had so much fun learning it. You're already in it. And you don't want to do anything else. Oh yeah. Well, did you ever experience Absolutely. like that? What was your What was your like? Ah, uh, I, I just go into the grind after like a failed performance or something. Yeah, some, sometimes what what happens actually happens normally around once once a year. You know, I yeah. when you've been one year late, uh, more more you know high end complex things, then you have to play something really basic and <laughs> oh what the hell? How the hell is 
how the hell I'm gonna play this? Yeah. Can you go back to the base book, the first book that you studied? Oh, this the book number one. Oh, we start again. Let's start. Let you know. Let's let's go back to the basics and relearn everything. And <laughs> sometimes it's good thing. Really, it's yeah. really some, sometimes you start, start start forgetting the basics. Yeah, and that's you know it, it happens because you actually there's lots of things that you don't use them every day. So then you forget how to do it. So it's, sometimes it's good to go back. Back to the really basics and re- re- start to check if you really really know everything. When you think you know everything, you re- usually don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. When you think you do, that's when you're slipping. But also, it's like the basic yeah. things that are kind of like when when you first basic the, the, like basic things are like kind of rhythms and like those apply to everything in yeah. music, you know. And like going back and revisiting those are the most kind of potent things because you find that in the complicated and the easy oh, yeah. things, you know, like. And the the idea of the beginner's mind is always like a refreshing, good place to be for any creative endeavor. I think that's well said. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. And and there's there's lots lots of kids they actually they want to learn the bass. They you know they want to oh I want to be Steve White. They just they spend like ninety percent of the time time trying to learn solos. Yeah. Then you then you have to tell oh yeah but okay, listen to some songs. The solo is like five percent of the songs. So <laughs> but you cannot play the ninety percent of the time. If you don't know how to play the rest, you never play in a band. Right. You know that's the basics you first learn. Otherwise, you're never gonna be a musician. And th- no, that's that's also well said. Like so much of the flash and so yeah. much of the thing that makes you drawn to the thing is the smallest percent of the song. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. and playing as a unit is the whole the whole thing. And like <laughs> exactly. <that's laughs> definitely... If you don't mind. <laughs> That's definitely the the lesson we all learn pretty quick, dude. You're soloing the whole time. I need you to play the chord. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Wow. That's awesome, well, Timo. What a uh, what does Armor Don got coming out next? What do you guys got on the horizon? We are we are gonna actually, actually we need to cover some of I forgot the name actually I forgot the name of the song but one old song of Johnny Cash we yeah? did kind of a heavier version of. Release that maybe next month. Oh, we are mixing sick. it now, so we're gonna that's be out like still this year, surely. But I think we we try to get it out before Christmas, and then I think maybe we're gonna still re- release maybe one more song from the album. And I assume around April, uh, I think in the end of March, most likely we're gonna release the whole album, the fourth album of the band. And after that, the plan is to start touring. So we are trying to book dates in USA and Europe and try to get the band back on the road again. You know, playing in the studio and playing trance, but the, the you know the reason why we play in the band is because we want to travel, we want to play everywhere for right. people. You know, that's that that's the reason to be in a band. So that's what we really want to get back into doing. Beautiful. Well, I hope I hope to catch you guys in Cleveland when you guys hit the states. Would be awesome. And well, hey Timo, thank you so much for uh, chatting with me. This was a fun music guitar head dive. I really appreciate your insight. <laughs> Um, I really dug Thanks. diving into yeah. Armored Dawn's career, and I really appreciate the second the second take on this interview. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me here again. Yo, Spike Spiegel here. You just listened to Zig of the Gig podcast. Keep riding the bebop. See you, Space Cowboy. Bang.